I'm glad to see so many people are arriving for this panel. I think it's going to be a very interesting one. This is the panel on psychedelics, injustice, and the intersectionality of trauma. And as you can see, it's a large group, so I'm just going to give a short bio for each participant. Uh, Paula Kahn is a social justice organizer who's facilitating the transition from war to peace. Uh, Jay Sevelius leads several research projects at UCSF in the Center for Excellence in Tra for Transgender Health that are focused on leveraging uh, data to develop culturally relevant trauma-informed and transgender-specific programs uh, and interventions to help promote health and wellness among transgender people. Ishmael Ali uh, earned his JD at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Um, he believes that psychedelic consciousness is a crucial piece of challenging oppression in all its forms and that legal access to psychedelics is an essential part of the drug policy program paradigm. Lisana Redbear is deeply rooted in the oral history and family values of her indigenous ancestors of Aslan, Ikana, Chicana, Apa and Apache Nde, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this properly, Lisana, of the Cimarron Mountains and the, and the, and the Mexica of Tepehuan, Mexico. And uh, I'm sure you'll get to know them much better, and I'm going to leave the rest of this uh, to them. Hello, 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 hello. Is it okay if we just use the single mic? Is that all right? Great. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday. Happy conference. Thank you for being here. Happy Science Day. Thank you for, be, for being here at 9.30 in the morning. Um, I'd like to start before getting into any of the content to just take a brief moment um, to close our eyes and to just get grounded in a little bit present in the space. So you can take a moment to appreciate the fact that we're floating, floating in the air 21 stories above the ground that we're in this room together, and that we are in the midst of embarking on a very long journey, not just in this panel, but into the future, one that started many, many generations ago, and one that will continue for many, many more generations. Bismillah. A very wise person told me this morning um, that the revolution will be compassionate and that the next stage in evolution, whether it's of consciousness or a physical self or whatever else, will not just not be televised, probably on social media, realistically, um, but that it will have empathy and that it will have depth. And um, I think that's what this conversation here today is about. It's about empathy and depth and understanding true complexity of those concepts. I'll start by very, very briefly introducing a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to pass it on to our amazingly capable candidates to introduce themselves, introduce the topic, and then we'll get into some questions. There will be ample time at the end for questions from the audience, so I encourage you to really think about what is challenging you, what comes up for you, and what you feel like sharing or asking here in public in this panel. My name is Ismail Lourido Ali. I was born in Fresno, California, a little bit south of here. I identify as a Sufi Muslim, as a raver, as a drug user, as a lawyer. Um, I'm currently a policy fellow for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and I do uh, policy and advocacy work with MAPS, um, both at the kind of local, national, and international levels. I was polit politically socialized uh, as a teenager in the post-9-11 era, and um, it was the American response to 9-11, and both domestically and internationally, that kind of shaped my political identity. And it was in that process 
uh, of socialization and of clarification of my identity that I began to recognize these patterns of trauma that existed in my own lineages and in the lineages of the people that were enacting a lot of this oppression and a lot of this challenge. That path and that dissonance led me to my own experience uh, with psychedelic medicine and with psychedelic consciousness that has led me slowly over time through understanding issues of surveillance in the United States to issues of civil rights abuses to issues of international oppression and imperialism and all of the pieces that kind of go along with that. But my identities and the things that I understand are limited to the experiences that I've had and to what I've understood to be true via the teachings from my parents and my own context and my own learnings. And I've recognized that that's limited. And I think part of what I would love to do today with these incredible people is expand not only my own knowledge, because I will be learning here on this panel, but also expand the knowledge of each of us and kind of recognize where our own outer limits are and what we do know and what we don't. And what is it that we're forgetting in the conversations that we're having this weekend and why it's important to focus on those things that we're forgetting. So today we're going to be talk talking about some really specific issues. And there's, um, as we've been discussing kind of previously, the, the issues of trauma and the relationship between trauma and different kinds of harm is being articulated in different ways slowly over the course of this conference. But just last year, I was at a uh, neuroscience of addiction conference at Stanford University, and there was not a single mention of trauma in the entire day, which was a surprise to me and a surprise to some of the other people that were there because in conversations around not just addiction, but a lot of other disorders and a lot of other challenges that people have, trauma is becoming more and more live of a concept. But I don't think everyone, myself included, necessarily understands what trauma is, and I think to start, understanding what that looks like and how that kind of interacts with the work that these panelists do is a big piece of it. So in the introductions that I asked our panelists to give, I would love for them to share whatever they feel any reflections are on what the relevance of trauma is in this conversation. What does the term intersectionality mean for them in this conversation and how that you know intersects with their own identities and their own work? Hi, my name is Monica Williams and I'm on the faculty at the University of Connecticut, and I'm really excited to be here, and I'm, I'm just humbled by all of you here in the audience to, to um, listen to our panel and be part of our discussion. Um, I, I have always been interested in access to mental health care, and this started for me even before I started graduate school when I had a, a loved one who um, suffered from OCD and bipolar and spent five years looking for the right kind of help. And so that was, for me, the, uh, the catalyst to go into um, mental health care and, and, to, and to get my degree. I studied clinical psychology and um, ended up, after graduating, working at Penn in a you know, lovely clinic there with, with a big focus on um, OCD and PTSD, where I trained under Edna Foa. And even though we were in you know, kind of the heart of Philadelphia, the treatments were not accessible. Um, to most of most of the folks there, it was really mostly affluent people who could really come and get the the treatments that we offered, um, and so, you know, and it was so through this process that um, it became really evident that um, we need to really do more to uh, make sure that the treatments that we're spending so much time and money investing in and developing are available to everyone, and. Um, and it became really clear to me during that time that we didn't really understand the entire experience of trauma in people of color, and that a big piece of this trauma is um, cultural trauma, historical trauma, and everyday racism. And these things are not even touched or addressed in our conventional uh, screening or assessment measures or our, um, our um, empirically supported protocols for treating PTSD. And so. Um, so that's been really one of the driving forces behind the work that I do, and I've become very impressed with the work that's being done at MAPS in terms of uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, and one of the things I'm really excited about is being able to make that treatment more accessible to people of color, particularly the African-American community and, um, and the Hispanic community, and these, these groups have been largely absent from the research studies, and so, um, so I think it's really important that 
that we um, see that the treatments are generalizable um, to, to everybody, including these you know, stigmatized, marginalized um, groups that are, that are really largely not benefiting from um, the scientific advances. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula, Paula Khan. I am Code Pink's co-producer of the People's Tribunal on the Iraq War, and I am Code Pink's local peace economy organizer. I'm also a hotline advocate for community initiatives to visit immigrants in confinement, and I help operate a hotline that connects people in immigrant detention to their loved ones for no additional cost. It's such an honor to be here with you all, and I'm so grateful that you all showed up for this conversation. I feel like we're truly um, doing something very unique uh, in this historical moment. And um, I'm really fortunate to have received a high school education in which I was introduced to anti-oppression pedagogy and uh, consent education at the same time that I was also exploring um, my identity psychedelically and attending raves and um, really uh, connecting with the idea of peace, love, unity, and respect. And um, my psychedelic journeys really made me acutely aware of the oppression that exists in this world due to colonization and slavery. And I constantly am hyper aware that we haven't recovered from those wounds that have been so deeply inflicted and are continuously reinforced through our daily interactions with each other. And so I just want to call upon all of y'all to join me in um, incorporating the struggle for social justice and liberation and abolition into your psychedelic practices. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, feel really honored to be here and to be among these amazing people and you are all amazing people. Uh, my name is Jay Sevelius. I am a clinical psychologist and a research faculty at the University of California, San Francisco. I do community-based research with transgender communities, uh, particularly transgender women of color. I help uh, develop uh, culturally relevant trauma-informed interventions uh, for transgender women living with HIV. Uh, for transgender women who are incarcerated and um, you know help to support transgender women in increasing their access to health care and increasing um, kind of the stabilization once um, leaving incarceration. Um, I identify as gender queer and queer. I uh, grew up in Miami in a very multicultural family, Cuban and Filipino, but I walk with a lot of uh, cisgender privilege and white privilege and so I'm constantly um, you know, in the place of really looking a lot at humility and really approaching the communities that I work with with a lot of um, just both humility and a lot of respect and, you know, in knowing that um, communities always know what they need best. And um, I think that's something to keep in mind as we're kind of rolling out um, uh, psychedelic therapies as well. Um, transgender people in particular suffer from tremendously disproportionate rates of PTSD and suicidality. Um, you know, in the largest studies of trans people, we found that 40% have attempted suicide at some point in their life. And that's trans adults, even trans youth, it's 30% have attempted suicide at some point in their life. And the rates of PTSD, um, after controlling for, you know, uh, discrete episodes of trauma, everyday discrimination independently predicts PTSD. So it's, we're not just talking about single experiences of trauma, we're talking about continuous traumatic stress. And so in thinking about how something like MDMA therapy for PTSD might help these communities, we also have to think about the fact that, um, you know, we are sending people back out into experiences of ongoing trauma. And so how does MDMA therapy um, take that into consideration um, for communities that experience ongoing traumatic stress? And how do we start to ask how we can get away from this individualized approach to treating trauma? I'm going to treat this person's trauma and this person's trauma and, you know, focus on that episode. But what about cultural trauma, the trauma that we're experiencing as communities? And uh, are we ready 
to take that on? Are we ready to start asking ourselves um, these difficult questions? And I, I think it comes back again to this piece around cultural humility. It always starts with asking the communities, you know, what their perceptions are, what their needs are, and um, being led as opposed to um, leading those discussions. Thank you. I just want to first acknowledge the great spirit in this grandmother earth. I want to acknowledge the ancient ancestors from this land, uh, the indigenous people of this land, the Ohoni nation, intergenerational trauma. I'm walking a prayer to reclaim sacred in the 21st century. As an artist and a Native American mental health specialist, and a mental health professional with over 30 years in the field of direct services. Um, I specialize in crisis intervention and working with indigenous populations. Uh, within indigenous populations, there is real trauma, lived trauma in an urban setting and a reservation setting. Uh, trauma is something that is actually occupies your body and when that trauma is triggered it's actually a physical sensation it's not um, just in the mind and it's not just about I lost touch with myself that's the oversimplification of an explanation for that trauma is complex and most of the times trauma comes from external forces that's what creates fear is realizing that the world that you live in is not safe for your existence. What's worse is that it's just because you were born and colonial forces wanted you exterminated. So in the United States, there's actually policies of extermination. Wrap your mind around that. Policies of extermination of indigenous people there's a legacy. Indian hatred is happening today. The silencing of indigenous people is happening today. It's happening at this conference. Not only that, but when indigenous people speak their truth, it's recontextualized by the white dominant culture and the white dominant voice. That adds to re-traumatization. There's nothing worse than trying to speak the truth about your experience and the real trauma and the real pain that you have witnessed or experienced yourself and then having that dismissed or invalidated because that renders you once again into the place of the margins, of the place of being silent, of the place where your voice isn't really important. Stay in your place, stay oppressed, stay silent, do what we ask and when we come to you for information, you better be happy to provide us all your sacred secrets for the almighty dollar. What I want to see is all those people who like to go to indigenous communities and gather sacred secrets and then publish a book revealing those sacred secrets never seen before, never exposed before. I want to see them on the front lines. I want to see them fighting the oil and gas corporations. I want to see them defending the earth with indigenous populations. Because I tell you what, indigenous people are defending the earth in a real sense and we're under threat. And if you don't understand how that affects your mindset and your mental and emotional health to live for over 500 years in constant colonial occupation, I ask that you then start to study your own decolonization and start to look at the colonized mindset. Because through the process of American construction, like you, you can't start history of psychedelics in the 60s in the Americas. That needs to stop. We use this. We use this medicine before Jesus Christ walked this earth. So I work in the community of people that are disenfranchised. I work with the most impoverished people. 
what Gandhi called the untouchables, because that's where my heart is, with the people that are continually oppressed and silenced. And for those of you who have privilege and platforms to share information, don't speak on behalf of indigenous peoples. Make it possible, like this beautiful, these beautiful young people made it possible for me to come and speak to you. Bring the people to speak for themselves. That's one first step in decolonization of this conference. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, just to give a little uh, roadmap for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to introduce two topics with a few questions in each topic. And we'll have just a discussion on each of those topics, um, about 10 minutes each or so. And then at the end, again, start thinking about questions. We'll have time at the end for people to come up and kind of share what they're thinking about and what's relevant for them, what's alive for them. So the two topics generally are, first, what's the relationship between psychedelics, psychedelic therapy, and intersectional trauma? And then the second, is what are the implications of an intersectional lens on therapy, psychedelic therapy, and trauma? So on this first topic, what's the relationship between the psychedelics, psychedelic therapy, and intersectional trauma? I'm going to ask a few questions, and y'all can just dis discuss kind of whatever whatever is relevant out of those. So psychedelic therapy clearly holds promise for, for people experiencing PTSD and experiencing other trauma-based challenges. But its promise so far does seem limited. So first, why does the present medical and psychedelic therapy paradigm struggle with its ability to recruit and thus treat people from marginalized populations? Two, who could benefit from psychedelic therapy that isn't already visible in the current paradigm? And three, how can we bring more access and visibility to these underdiagnosed and undertreated populations that you identify? Big question. Um, so, so I think one of the really important issues is that um, for people of color, and particularly um, African Americans, and that's really mainly the community that I that I study and work with, um, <clears throat> we have well, first of all, a, a long history in this country of of abuse, enslavement, imprisonment, and extermination of of African Americans, particularly African American men. The system is designed. Um, to to enslave, incarcerate, and kill them. And if you don't believe me, just turn on the television and you can see law enforcement, people who are supposed to be protecting and defending us, killing us, um, you know, with impunity. And so given that backdrop, um, you know, embarking on a treatment that is potential, that is illegal and potentially um, will get you incarcerated at rates, you know, much, much higher uh, than would be faced or risked by white Americans. Well, this is a really hard treatment to justify. You put a lot at stake, and once you've got a felony on your record, you can't get an education, you can't get a job, you know, you um, you can't get housing, and so uh, there's so much more at stake for people of color to risk using these therapies. And so, uh, as so as a result, um, you know, many of us are well better safe than sorry. Additionally, there's a tremendous amount of stigma surrounding drug use, particularly um, among African Americans, as um, you know, who are being seen as people who um, shouldn't have drugs. And much, there's no there's no message in society that okay, you need more drugs um, to help you. Rather, it's like oh, that's the problem. You people abuse drugs, and so it's really hard to get a message of of health in there, and that these um, you know, and that these substances may have potential to help and cure a lot of the problems um, that we're facing because of because of really our oppressive social structure. So. so I think we all really have to sit with um, the demographics of this conference because there's some of us that have this um, these goggles that were turned on for us when we really started to process our own oppression and our identity under colonization. And for some of us, once we have those goggles on, we can't take them off because we have all of these interactions that are so defined by centuries of oppression and 
extermination and genocide. And I would say that the demographics here at this conference are the way they are because some people are trying to survive, like they are doing the most to have the bare minimum. Um, and I would really encourage you all to begin your journey in understanding what has shaped uh, the world order by reading Bartolome de las Casas, a short account of the destruction of the Indies. Because if we're really gonna uh, walk the path or go along the path of psychedelic studies and psychedelic therapy, we really have to have an intimate understanding of the atrocities that were committed in the geographies inhabited by those who have been the most impacted by colonization and slavery. Um, we have to bear witness to those atrocities through colonial texts and really understand why we live cultures of violence and we have to be accountable to those cultures of violence and we have to be accountable to how we reinforce and uphold violence and inequality. I'll say that for now, but I probably will have more to say in a bit. I think it's, you know, I, I understand that it's um, incredibly strategic right now to be moving forward with a Western medicalized framework um, for many of these therapies. But I think we also have to consider the fact that, so for, you know, transgender communities in particular, we've been told over and over and over again by the medical establishment that we're damaged we're crazy, we're inauthentic, uh, we don't know who we are. Um, reparative therapy is still alive and well in this country and that is a form of extermination. And when you know young trans people are um, committing suicide and attempting suicide at the rates that they are, um, you know there's something there to look at. You know we don't have the systems in place, especially from a Western medicalized framework, to um, support our young people and to support trans and gender queer communities and queer communities more generally. Um, you know therapists are seen as gatekeepers. Um, by trans communities, they have to get letters from therapists in order to get access to the gender affirming health care that they need. And, um, you know, in when someone, when the, the medical establishment again and again commits violence against trans people, it's very unlikely that um, trans people are going to be early adopters of things like um, clinical trials of a, you know, an experimental therapy. Um, even though I do believe in the hope and the promise of these therapies um, for all of us. But it really does need to be a collective healing for all of us. And what that means is looking to you know whose voice is not being heard, who is not being represented here, who is not benefiting from the, this promise. And um, if we're really in the midst of a, psych a psychedelic renaissance, um, who are we leaving behind? So this might be the wrong crowd <clears throat> because you're all here, so I'm assuming that you are already raising your awareness and consciousness about these kind of questions. But I just have a question for you, like raise the hands. How many of you have heard of Leonard Peltier? Oh, I give you guys an award. Yeah. You guys are the, the largest audience with the most hands that I've seen ever. So in compared to that, how many of you know Nelson Mandela? About the same. That's the first time that's ever happened. Usually when I ask that question, there's maybe one or two hands in the audience who know of Leonard Peltier. But most of the times, the majority of the people in the audience know who Nelson Mandela is. For those of you who are not familiar with Leonard Peltier, he's actually the longest held political prisoner in the United States. He's been in prison since the 1970s for a crime that he didn't commit. The FBI basically framed him for murder of two FBI agents on the Jumping Bull Ranch on the Pine Ridge Reservation after they were actually, the American Indian Movement was actually attacked and shots were fired toward the house where there's grandmothers and children living there. The reason why I bring up Leonard Peltier is because Leonard Peltier many years ago said that the 
prison industrial complex is the largest growing Indian reservation in the United States. <clears throat> Piggybacking on what Monica said, in people of color are prey. You know that there's this, um, there's a video that's called like hunting season or shooting season. I have to Google it, but kind of Google it um, because it's actually about this time of the year where indigenous women disappear from Canada. What's not said is that there's a lot of focus of the indigenous women disappearing in Canada. There's little focus of indigenous women disappearing on La Frontera, the Mexican border. And this is where our sacred medicine grows. There's over 4,000 women disappeared or murdered, indigenous women across the Mexican border. And that number grows. But per capita population, right? This is per capita population. There's more American Indians incarcerated than any other ethnic population in the United States. And per capita population, and this isn't a numbers game, oppression, race, I want to be oppressed more than you kind of stuff, but this is a necessary voice because this issue is rendered invisible, is rendered silenced. There's actually, per population of indigenous people in the United States, more people getting murdered by police. Pregnant women, pregnant indigenous women, two of them I know so far, not personally, I know of their case, were murdered while they were pregnant by police. It's, it's outrageous. The lack of visibility in media, the lack of curiosity from dominant culture who, who maintains at this moment, especially this research moment of right, white supremacy, maintain, uh, it maintains the status quo of white supremacy and, and elitism of that. So yesterday, maybe some of you heard me say, Use your privilege. Use your privilege. Because guess what? Capitalism doesn't care what color of skin you have. And pretty soon, this is the reality. Indigenous people have always been the canaries in the coal mine. What happens to indigenous people happens to the earth and will eventually happen to you. And we see this happening with this current administration. It's going to affect everything that we do, even in, in mental health and behavioral health, because our funding for community mental health services are always under assault. Really, the, the care plan is, if you're sick, good luck, hope you do better, or hope you die fast. That really isn't a, a healing model for indigenous people or people of color. Thank you. The next topic looks a little bit at understanding the frameworks that y'all just described and thinks about how we can project those into the future and perhaps shift some of the dynamics that have been discussed today. So what are the implications of this intersectional lens and this lens that looks at different kinds of oppression on psychedelics and psychedelic therapy? You've touched on it a bit in this first answer, but I have a few more questions. First, what does a genuinely accessible paradigm look like? You could design it from the ground up. What would that look like? How can we build that paradigm now? What, would, what must we change? And what kind of vision do you have for the future, whether it's about psychedelic therapy or otherwise? How can each person in this room help build that with their own behaviors and actions? And again, you've touched on it a bit, but I would love to speak more about what does that look like? What, is, what are the symptoms and how do we deal with them? Thank you for that. So, so I think one problem that we have is the mentality that, you know, the benevolent white people will be, you know, givers of medicine to, you know, the underprivileged masses of color. And this is what needs to shift. It can't be like, here, we are, we are gifting you with, you know, these wonderful tools that we've discovered. 
it's really got to be a situation where we're all at the table. So we need to see people of color, indigenous people, LGBT people, everybody that needs access to these things has to be a part of a part of making it happen. So I would challenge all of you to look at your places of work, your places of study, your, your research teams, your clinical teams. Are they diverse or do they replicate what we see here at the conference? As long as that happens, there's not going to be um, equal access. The, the paradigm is never going to be, to be fair. It, it's always going to be a situation where the, the best treatments are going to the white privileged elite and then the people of color get what's left. And so, um, and so in order for it to be fair, people in power have to not only see that there's racism, discrimination, and oppression, but they have to recognize their white privilege and be willing to give that up. And when someone has an advantage or a privilege, they don't want to give it up. It's not a natural thing to say, here, take my privilege. Um, but in order for us to have a truly non-racist, egalitarian, a uh, fair society, people at the top have to be willing to say, what are my privileges? What are my advantages? What are my unearned privileges? How did I get here? And what can I give up to make that fair for everyone? So, so for me, I think it means that we all become accountable to those privileges that we have because of those legacies of colonialism and slavery. It means that you follow in the lead of the most oppressed, the most disenfranchised people, and you listen. You turn up your listening skills and you ask, how can I be of service? Guide me. And then you, know, you fill in the gaps. It means being out in the streets. It means holding political leaders accountable. It means getting up early on a Saturday morning to go to a town hall. It means doing challenging things that are inconvenient for our privileged lives. It means becoming an abolitionist because right now we're all invested in a war economy. We're all invested in mass incarceration through the corporations and the consumerism that we're um, affiliated with. And so in order for us to pursue decolonization, we have to bear witness. We have to um, expose ourselves to things that are ugly and that are other people's realities. And we have to commit to um, to intervening and disrupting. We can't let people languish in detention centers because of borders. You hear me? We can't do that. I, I pick up phone calls. I, I actually found out about this conference when I was 17, and I've just been on a personal journey of decolonization, and I've been doing psychedelic research on myself, and when I have psychedelic experiences, sometimes I hear indigenous women screaming, sometimes really nasty visions come back to me because I'm not healed from the colonial wound, and it's really hard. And my life is so committed towards liberation that my work means that I'm constantly re-traumatizing myself and, you know, like, let's say, you know, the Women's March, it was like the largest protest that's happened since the invasion of the Iraq War. How many of those people have been in the recent um, uprisings? Not as many people. So it requires for all of us to show up. And we, as Angela Davis has said, we have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. We all have to put in like 100 bajillion percent um, because we're all accountable and we all profit or are invested in the war economy in some way through our taxpayer money, through our um, subjugation of each other. So thank, thank workers, thank the custodial staff at this hotel, thank, thank people who offer you a service, be humanizing. Um, and, and really if we're, if we're going on psychedelic journeys, you know, it's all about raising consciousness. So we really have to be self-aware, be mindful of all of your interactions and how they're defined. Read more colonial texts to understand why things are the way they are. When I think about the, the uh, sort of Western medicalized paradigm that we're currently in um, with psychedelic science, I think a lot about, you know, um, how we're replicating the larger uh, medicalized framework in terms of, you know, why aren't there more people of color in clinical trials? I mean, this isn't unique to psychedelic science. Um, this is a kind of across the framework. And so we're not going to be able to answer these questions with the same paradigm that, that we're creating these problems within. We have to be willing to question our paradigm, 
question our methodologies. We have to be willing to acknowledge our limitations. So I mean, one very easy starting place would, would be, I would like to see a lot more of the white cisgender male researchers presenting their research, acknowledging the limitations of the population that they're studying, of the lack of diversity that's represented, and the lack of um, even awareness of what, of, of you know, where we need to go next, because it's not going to come from you know that white cisgender male researcher. Um, who is not in touch with the communities that we need at the table. And so I, just to echo what Monica was saying about like it cannot happen without the voices of the people um, at the table because it's not necessarily going to go in the direction that we think it's going to go in. It's not about um, you know creating some tool that that works for white people in the setting of clinical trials and then saying how can we how can we invite more people to you know get different faces into our into our trials. It's not going to work that way. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, how we as researchers need to do a lot more um, like qualitative work. Um, first of all, a lot more self-reflection, having a lot more dialogue, having a lot more humility. It starts with the engagement and building trust. And one of the um, things from community organizing that I think applies here is moving at the speed of trust. Not moving, not moving faster than that, not moving slower than that, but as trust is built within communities, um, that's the speed that we move at. And trust is built by listening. And I think, you know, I, I'm really excited to think more about, you know, what that looks like. How do we talk to people about, um, you know, what their experiences of psychedelics are and if it's, if it's in the context of a Western medicalized paradigm. Obviously, indigenous folks have been doing this and have a cultural context for this that is not, not acknowledged by our psychedelic science Western medicalized um, framework. And that's, a, you know, a whole other um, piece of history that is, is being lost and is being um, invisibilized, and, and at this conference in particular. Um, but as long as we're working within this framework, I think we need to stretch ourselves, we need to keep having these dialogues, and there needs to be a lot of self-reflection. I do believe that psychedelics have the power to transform consciousness, um, but we can't keep working within the same framework that we created these problems within. So I told my 86-year-old mom, I'm going to a conference in Oakland. And she goes, what's it called? And I said, psychedelic science. And she said, what's that? And I said, well, mom, I was coming across this announcement. And I saw all these non-native people going to talk about our sacred medicine. My mother's Apache from the Cimarron Mountains. We come from Atzlan. My father's mother is Mexica from Tepajuan, from northern Mexico. So these are where our sacred sacraments grow, OK? So my mom says, well, first I said, I applied for a scholarship. And so she goes, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that you get it and so that you can go there. But when you go there, I want you to speak the truth. And I want you to defend the medicine. So we don't actually relate to this uh, vernacular psychedelic. We relate to the spirit of the medicine, sacred medicine. So sacred that I don't really even like to talk it, about it, you know. That's how sacred it is. So absolutely different worldviews. The other thing that's different is that I don't participate in ingesting things unless there's a ceremony, unless it's taken care of by a ceremonial leader, or unless there's deep healing that needs to be taking place and there's a facilitator, a medicine person to do that. And that doesn't mean that you went to a two-week course and now you're a shaman. Right? Because we have too much of that going on. And that's no disrespect to people who think that you are. But I ask that you rethink that. You know, because ultimately that's going to end up hurting yourself. Because the spirit is always listening. 
The creator is always listening. The elders told me that when you ingest that medicine and you start praying or you start talking, a tape recorder is pushed. And the spirits hear it. And they're going to hold you accountable to what it is you're saying and what it is you're doing. So be careful what you say and be careful what you ask for. So that's just like a little tiny, little, little tiny foundation that is a difference between I want to have the psychedelic experience and I'm all for expanding consciousness. Um, but it has to be what I can, what I'm mostly concerned with is harming people, right? We heard yesterday during a presentation, do no harm. That was a, that was a emphasis, do no harm. So I think that we really need to take that into consideration. In my understanding, indigenous people who come from reservations and have a reservation and are federally recognized and are able to have the capital, those folks are building or have already built healthcare centers and are taking care of, of their people in their own healthcare centers. The problem with that is when I go to a lot of these places, too many Western modalities are imprinted on top of the treatment that we're giving and providing for our people. So when I say that I'm reclaiming sacred, I'm, I'm doing the first doctorate on both sides of my family for the very first time. That speaks to oppression. It's 2017. We've been here before the ships came. We survived, you know, and I'm trying to thrive. I'm trying to do all that the great white father told me to do, get an education, get a job, be self-sustainable, but don't be too self-sustainable because we don't really want you too self-sustainable. Don't try to enact your sovereignty, your self-determination, because that's going too far. We want you to be a bit oppressed. It's complicated, but I tell you one unifying force, and that's that all of our children's future are at risk and all of our grandchildren's futures are at risk. And I've been holding down my end of my job, surviving. I was born into struggle. I was born into resistance. I was a little kid the first time I was called a nigger. Can you imagine that? I don't even consider myself to be a dark-skinned native. But growing up in the Southwest, I was too dark. And I wanted to play a Diné game, which is a, a string game. You know what a string game is, where you have a string and you're looping it in and out? How many of you know that that's actually an indigenous Diné game? Right on for all of you who do. So I wanted to play a game because I seen a, a little white girl in, in school, fifth grade, true story, Kim Curtis did it. I outed her at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Like, 40 years later, I still remember. <laughs> it was my education, my social studies and anthropology. I asked her, I said, hey, do you want to play? I know that game. I'm like thinking, here's a white girl that knows how to play the string game. This is amazing to me. And she said to me, matter of factly, I don't play with niggers. And that's a very offensive word. I went home and I told my mom, and my mom's like, we don't even use that language. Intergenerational trauma is real. Talk to indigenous people and ask them how many of their family members have been murdered. You know, I mean, that's, you have to build a relationship before you ask those kind of questions, obviously. <laughs> but if you're able to do that, just ask them. There's a serious violence. It's an intergenerational violence. I saw that violence in Morton County Sheriff's Department. So my son's enrolled with the Pine Ridge Reservation. Oh, first of all, before I forget, two books, OK? Two books. Leonard Crow Dog, Four Generations of Sioux Medicine Men, and 
Richard Drennan's book. So Leonard Crodog and Richard Eerdos wrote the Leonard Crodog Four Generations of Sioux Medicine Men book. And then Richard Drennan wrote Facing West, The Metaphysics of Indian Hating and Empire Expansion. If you want a history of colonialism and how it came from the East and came from the South, the Richard Drennan book is excellent on that. There were actually white people who wanted to coexist with indigenous people that came here. Can you imagine that? There was a guy, and I can't remember his name, but it's in that Richard Drennan book. He wanted to be with the native people, and he went and he lived with the native people. And then the Puritans got wind of it. I think his last name was Morton. They got him. They sent him back to England in chains. Find out who this ancestor of yours is because he had something going on in his mind. He saw something beautiful and he wanted to embrace that. And for that, he was demonized, put in chains, and sent back. Imagine that. So it's not like it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented that na Native people and non-Native people have tried to build alliances or tried to coexist. But unfortunately, there was too many people that came from Europe, um, you know, the Netherlands, uh, France, Spain, without that mindset. And what happened is that they traded their identity and their culture for this political construct that's called white. There are no white people, people. You, part of reclaiming sacred is reclaiming your own sacred identity through your own ethnicity and culture. That's part of decolonization. White people have been stripped from their own cultural identity, mostly because it was given up for political power. Because even now to this day, and it's echoed in this election, poor white people, and 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. Let's not forget that Donald Trump don't represent me. He doesn't represent my community. He, re he represents that colonial mindset, the patriarchal hierophant that we're supposed to worship and bow down to. No dice. No dice. My grandma wasn't bowing. I'm not going to bow. I have to live a life of integrity and do good work. My intent is not to polarize. My intent is to speak truth that is often not heard. And just really quickly, as a medical professional who understands how to evaluate and assess mental illness per the DSM-5, <laughs> although I don't like it, it's not my preference, right? I'm not into labeling. I'm putting that in my PhD because I don't think it's helpful to um, label indigenous people or anybody with a mental illness because it's so stigmatizing. Should we cut? Okay. Okay, sorry. What was I talking about? <laughs> okay. This is so cool, again? but we're labeling. labeling. We're in question time, and I'm going to okay. give you that. We're due to have a break. I'm going to give you an extra 15 minutes so you can take questions because I'm sure that none of these people wants to leave right now. All right. I kind of lost my train of thought, but check out those books and do what you can with what it is that you have to actually build common ground. I know what I was going to say, that yesterday I experienced something very, very odd. I experienced public shaming and humiliation at this conference because I dared to speak the truth about re-traumatization of indigenous people. And when I did that, my comments were dismissed. And how were they dismissed? By the great white father telling me that I'm deeply wounded. Well, you know, deeply wounded people aren't necessarily rational or articulate. They're flawed. They're deficient. I know I work with populations of people who are continually 
rendered voiceless. So that public pathologizing of my truth as an indigenous woman who's witnessed and experienced re-traumatization in a real sense. And I tell you what, it's, it's traumatic to know that your sacred medicine is under threat because white folks are eating peyote too much and you don't have enough medicine for your ceremony and your grandma's ceremony and they need healing and you can't get the medicine or because rich, wealthy folks are buying all the medicine and now the prices are skyrocketing where people who are humble people who never prayed to the God of money don't have the money to buy the medicine that we need because everything's based on capital now. We don't have the money to buy the medicines that we need. So like think about that if you want to talk about intersectionality and trauma and injustice. You know, I just thank you so much for being open to this because I can see that there are many of you that are actually internalizing this and that means the world to people who are rendered silent continually and continually. And, you know, I did what I did yesterday because my great grandmother came through me after this young woman was dismissed and it was an apathetic response of nothing can be done. And I tell you what, indigenous people aren't disappearing. We're not planning on disappearing. We're planning on saving the planet. So we'd love it if you could join us. Um, I wanna say something real quick. <laughs> that was amazing. It's like one second. Um, so yeah, if we're talking about the shift in practices on the topic of harm reduction so as not to reproduce colonial power dynamics and advance, and advance healing, we must incorporate anti-oppression and consent training to all care providers and anti-oppression and consent pedagogy must be introduced through therapy sessions. Thank you. Thank you, you amazing human beings. Um, we have been graciously extended to our time, so we have some time for questions. We are using this mic, so if you could either be really loud or... Just kidding, there's a mic there. Didn't see that. Great, okay, well, fire away, thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for this presentation. One comment and one question. Uh, I've been very, I'm a military trained psychiatrist, and I've been very heavily influenced by Victor Folletti down at the University of California, San Diego, and Bessel van der Kolk in Boston. Bessel van der Kolk at the Trauma Center in Boston, and Victor Folletti down at uh, San Diego. And they emphasized, have been emphasizing for years that the biggest form of terrorism in the world is child abuse which is cross-cultural and cross-sectional. And that most of, the, most of the medicine and most of the criminal population have a history of child abuse. And that's very seldom talked about. It was slightly referred to here, but rarely is it ever talked about in conferences. It's like a hidden wound in our society. Your question is? My question is, what are your views on child abuse in general, cross-culturally? Also, just for some procedural stuff, I think what we'll do is we'll take a few questions and then the panelists can just respond to whatever they feel like responding instead of doing one at a time. So we'll get like three or four questions and then go through that. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. So I also identify as a raver and psychedelic explorer, but also as a survivor who lives with PTSD um, and also as a doctor and a white woman with an incredible amount of privilege. So you mentioned not being able to take off your goggles, and that's a difference. Like, I feel like I can take off my goggles because I'm not constantly forced to revisit my trauma. So I'm curious, like, two-part question. One, like a lot of people here, I want to help, but I don't know where to start. So if you have more recommendations of specific resources to access, and also you mentioned this idea of re-traumatizing yourself, and I'm very scared to be involved in this kind of work for that exact reason. So I'm curious what kind of self-care you engage in and what you'd recommend that helps combat this. Thank you. I can really briefly put a plug in for, in about 30 minutes, there will be an anti-racism in the psychedelic community training. Camille, could you raise your hand? Led by this human being. It's a community forum. It's in the schedule. Check it out and go. Anyway, 
the rest of the, will be answered later, but. In the Oakland room at 11. Hi, hello, I'm Jonas, I'm from Brazil. Thank you all for the presentation. And, well, I work with a um, young uh, criminal uh, named people from poor communities that are involved in drug trafficking. And I truly believe in the power of um, empathy and consilience. But when we work with these people and we let them talk, we see that the revolution will not be on empathy and in consilience uh, status, you know. So uh, what I would like to ask is if you have any uh, models of ideas and how this, all of these psychedelic ideas can go into the social role, not to treat people with trauma, but to treat the reasons why trauma is being made in society. Thank you. So we'll pause there and let the panelists get to some of these questions and then we'll get another round in a second. Yeah, some really great, great questions. Um, and for those of you who would like to get more training as a therapist and a clinician on how to how to work across racial and cultural differences, I just want to let you know I am going to be doing a two and a half day workshop in Seattle in September um, for clinicians, and I you know invite you all to to come and sign up because you know I, there's only so much we can do in a panel and in, in an hour, and um, and I really think that um, cultural um, competence or Rather, I prefer cultural humility. It's a process, and it's not like you know you come to one of these things for an hour and you're like, okay, I get it. It's a lifelong journey of learning and appreciating and valuing differences and practicing speaking and working across um, across race, ethnicity, and culture. And so, for those of you who, um, well, first I want to ask you, just ask yourself, do you have any close friends who are people of color? Seventy-five percent of white people don't. And if you don't know anybody, you can't understand them. And so don't think you can go and do therapy with somebody who's different when you don't even know anybody who doesn't look like you, right? So, um, so you have to get out there and make those connections. And, and I'll stop there. So I wanted to answer the question about how we can boost empathy or what our visions are for radically transforming how we relate to each other. And my wildest dreams are music festivals that incorporate social justice and um, like that, that are specifically for survivors of trauma. I think about all the folks in war zones within U.S. borders and outside of U.S. borders, and I just really think, you know, playing the most beautiful music, having a bunch of canvases, like it's really idealistic and utopic, but why not, right? Like anything is possible. you got to dream big. And I really dream for us to facilitate these spaces of healing, like free music festivals. I really believe in the power. If, if those if those spaces were able to transform me to a certain threshold until I realized that oppression was being reproduced in those spaces, if we work really hard to incorporate anti-oppression and decolonial pedagogy into those festival spaces where we affirm that there's abundance, where we um, also teach um, uh, rebuilding our ecosystems, et cetera, I really do believe that those can be, that can be the vanguard of transforming society. Wildest dreams. Um, yeah. I'll speak to the to the child abuse question from the perspective of trans communities. Um, you know, trans children generally aren't born into trans families. So, um, you know, the, the rates of child abuse and neglect and um, homelessness among queer and, and gender queer communities is outrageous. The one thing that we found that actually predicts um, better adjustment in later life is family acceptance. And so, uh, you know, Stan Groff said yesterday that uh, psychedelics increases tolerance across differences, but we're not yet levitating in an ocean of bliss or something like that. So, you know, it's not, psychedelics aren't a panacea for all of the, um, you know, social ills that we have, but I think if we can use it to cultivate a culture of um, curiosity from a place of humility, curiosity about ourselves, curiosity about people who are different from us, and curiosity about what we don't know we don't know. And um, sometimes that's a hard place to come from where we're used to coming from uh, fields that treat us as experts and expect us to behave as if we're experts. And we have to really be willing to give that up, really be willing to give up the podium, be willing to um, speak from a place of, I don't know, 
And, um, you know, that's a place to start. I also wanted to speak to the question about um, trauma and re-traumatization in, in doing the work. Um, there's an amazing book called Trauma Stewardship. And do you yeah. remember the author's name? Yeah, I'm blank on the author's name, but she's a really amazing woman of color. She has created some um, training materials, and the book itself is just an incredible resource for doing this type of work. So thank you. So <clears throat> child abuse, in um, my whole PhD is based upon oral tradition. Um, you know, and I had to actually fight for that because they wanted it to, to be primarily based upon other PhD writers. And what I said is that, well, sorry, other PhD writers don't actually hold this knowledge. The only ones that hold this knowledge are the ones that have a PhD from life and creator. And those are our elders, right? My elders. So in part of this process, I actually talked about that. And my understanding, based upon the elder stories, is that Traditionally, historically, indigenous people of many, 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 many different tribes of the Americas actually cherished their children, were gentle to their children, were what the Puritans said, overly permissive with their children. They allowed their children to explore their environment too much. They had too much flexibility. So what was the plan for that? The boarding schools, the mission schools. My grandmother was left orphaned because her mother died while she was pregnant, being drugged by a buggy, by a flatbed wagon in, on the Cimarron Trail, on the Santa Fe Trail. In the, it would have been like 1890-something. And after that, they came for my, my grandmother to take her to the mission school. Well, my, my grandmother stayed at the mission school for like, I don't know, a half a second until she saw what was going on. This is, this is real, and I am proud of this story, okay? My grandmother witnessed the little children being abused by the nun teacher, okay? She was a nun. The little kids from her village crying, getting hit, getting paddled. Even my mom has a story of being paddled for jumping over a, a patch of grass. Draconian much? And um, my grandmother, in those days, you had a little pail, a little pail that they give you so that you could bring your little lunch to the schoolroom so you could eat it, right? So she had her little pail, and she's sitting in the room, and she's watching all this go down, and she said, not me, boy. My grandmother, my grandmother didn't speak English. She said, this is her phrases in English, not me, boy. She spoke some Spanish. Pura bullshit, which means that's pure bullshit. And no dice, Dave. <laughs> that's what I grew up with my mom, my grandma speaking English. Well, what were all those? What are all those? Those are all statements of drawing a line saying, you're not crossing this. I'm not going to be dehumanized, and I'm not going to be disrespected, and I'm not going to live a life without dignity. At the tender age of like five or six years old, my little Apache grandma, when she seen that nun up ahead, so this might give you some insight to my mother and myself, we are warriors, she picked up that pail, and she overhand chucked it right at the nun. Yes. She did. And, and that made it possible. She didn't wait to see what was going to happen. She didn't wait to see if it hit her. She turned around and she split. She ran out the door like a little road runner. Okay? Then she ran all the way across the river, through the valley, to go to the adobe house of her uncle, where she was hid by him. This is 1800s. Okay, 1890s. And, and that's the power of oral tradition, right? And storytelling. Because it humanizes an intergenerational love of people. You know, people have often accused me for being so strong because of anger. 
And I always have to correct them. I said, you misunderstand what you're seeing. I am my grandmother and my mother, and I stand strong because of their strength and their great love and their great courage. Everything I do is based upon love. And so I don't know if that helped you understanding that, but I think for indigenous people, we learned about child abuse from the colonized mindset. And unfortunately, through years of oppression, internalized that wound. And when you feel powerless, you take it out on the people that are most vulnerable next to you. We have the power to disrupt that cycle. Self-awareness and intent goes a long way, as well as like being able to control your impulses, step back. But I completely agree with you that child abuse has to be addressed. I have just been informed that we cannot take any more questions. I'm very sorry. Um, can we please just give a last round of applause to these people who have spoken so much? Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I have great gratitude to you for the courage to present this point of view, and thank you very much for coming.